Uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this talk. And today, I like to talk the current status of advanced care planning in Taiwan from the policy, research, and clinical perspectives. We all know that the goal of palliative care is to enhance the quality of dying and death. And by doing so, we have to enhance the quality of life for patients through the hard work of quality of care. Uh -huh. And actually, these three are uh, interchangeably in lots of literature, but as a matter of fact, they are different. In terms of quality of life, we're referring to the function of the patient, how the patient functions. Can the patient take care of him or herself? In terms of quality of care, that means the care that the medical personnel provides. In terms of quality of dying deaths, which referring to uh, the so-called good deaths of the patient. Can the patient die with dignity? Can the patient die uh, with the place that he or she wants? So forth. Now let me um, introduce a uh, very important landmark of palliative care in Taiwan. And we started from the year of 1982, start from home care, and was initiated in Catholic uh, uh, Medical Services Education Foundation. And later in the year 1990, we started the first inpatient hospice, uh, which was started in a, a Christian-based hospital, the Mackay Memorial Hospital. And the first public hospice was founded uh, in the year 1995 at National Taiwan University Hospital. And as you know, Taiwan launched the Nat Natural Death Act in the year 2000, which is very important for the following um, um, an act, uh, okay? And we, in the same year, we certifi certify palliative care specialist. So now we have about 700 palliative care specialists in Taiwan. And uh, two years later, we extend palliative care to non-cancer patients. So in Taiwan, there are eight categories of uh, non-cancer patients who can also benefit from palliative care. Uh, in the year 2016, we passed the Patient Right to Autonomy Act because even though we have the Natural Death Act, there are a lot of details need to be addressed. So this new law uh, guarantees more right to the patient. Okay? And we actually enact uh, the new law last year. I think this uh, depicts the uh, infrastructure for palliative care development in Taiwan. So the hospice development in Taiwan, I like to start from the policy perspective. You know that uh, we all work under the umbrella of the two policies, the Natural Death Act and the uh, National Cancer Control Program, as many countries uh, also have, okay? And um, uh, in terms of uh, financial uh, reimbursement, everything's under the national health insurance. So the patient basically, they uh, don't have to pay anything, including the medications or the medical services, okay? And the NGO plays a very important part. We have a lot of uh, foundations, irrespective of uh, religions or um, political stance. So we all help together to help uh, the promotion of hospice palliative care in Taiwan. And of course, the academic association are very active in um, training uh, medical personnel, uh, 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 both in uh, the uh, Taiwan Academy of Hospital Care Medicine and also nursing. So all these work together to promote uh, hospice palliative care in Taiwan. So this shows the numbers and growth of units of hospice inpatient wards and shared care. Uh, basically, in Taiwan, there's no single the inpatient hospice, and this is uh, this happens in the very early stage of the hospice uh, era. But later, we started to create the uh, so-called the, the uh, share care program, which means that the patient doesn't have to move to the hospice, and the medical team, the hospice team, including the doctors, nurses, they uh, visit the patients 
um, they uh, go to where the patient stays. So um, uh, as the non-cancer patient services started in the year 2009, uh, you can see here that we have more and more uh, shared care programs that are rapidly growing in Taiwan. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have around 700 um, uh, medical specialists, doctors, uh, hospice uh, doctors in Taiwan. Why why that happen? I remember when I gave a talk in Japan, uh, uh, Dr. Kizawa asked me, wow, how come you have so many hospice doctors in Taiwan? I think one of the secrets is that we incorporated the training uh, with family medicine. So basically, in the third year of the residency training, all the residents of family doctors have to um, uh, receive trainings in hospice care. And after they uh, graduate from the residency training, they can uh, take uh, tests for to be certified as a palliative care specialist. And that's why we're having so many uh, palliative care specialists in Taiwan. And the majority of them, around 70%, are family doctors. And we do have some internists and some radio oncologists. And this picture shows uh, the hospice team at National Taiwan University, the first uh, public inpatient hospice in Taiwan. Okay, now let's move to uh, the Patient Autonomy Act. And basically, um, this is one of the earliest study that uh, shows the ethical uh, dilemma uh, in Taiwan. And this study was published in JCO, which surveyed to 500 um, uh, physicians and asked them what are the ethical dilemma they consider. And it turns out that uh, truth telling ranks number one in Taiwan and is followed by place of care, and go home. Uh, doesn't want to go home due to uh, the fear of uh, lack of care. And these are um, very important. And also, there are dilemmas related to clinical management, which are artificial nutrition and hydration and the use of antimicrobial agents. Okay, so uh, these are the uh, ethical dilemma. And this study was published about uh, uh, in the year 2009, so it's many, many years ago. We conducted the same study after 15 years, and we'd like to see if there's any uh, change, any dramatic change in terms of ethical dilemma uh, as we um, enact the uh, Natural Death Act in Taiwan. So uh, it's very interesting to see that now place of care is the number one concern, and it's followed by use of antimicrobial agents and artificial hydration nutrition. Uh, the dilemma of truth telling, which used to rank number one, now rank number four. That shows that uh, the whole society is getting, you know, it getting more and more accepting uh, truth telling, and uh, as, uh, as a result of the Natural Death Act in Taiwan. Uh, you all know that uh, about five years ago, the Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, uh, conducted a big survey on quality of diet, quality of death uh, in uh, many, many countries, and Taiwan ranked number six in the world. Um, this is the uh, quality of death. But as a matter of fact, uh, I, I think this, um, I, I would say that probably macroscopically, but we have to be humble because microscopically, we, there are lots of things we need to improve, such as uh, some details uh, in service, some details in symptom management. There are a lot of things we need to improve. Okay, um, I think it was it was rated on five uh, domains: uh, health care and health environment, human resources, affordability of care, quality of care, and community engagement. And Taiwan uh, score high on quality of care, because there are lots of do not resuscitation um, uh, uh, increase, okay? And um, we're doing good on 
the affordability of care because everything is under the coverage of national health insurance. And um, but we are we need improvement in the palliative care environment, and also we need improvement in human resources because there are lots of um, uh, nurses uh, they can't stay in the hospice for too long. We we do have uh, some problem with human resources. Okay, so what about quality of dying? Um, uh, how do you rate that? So about many years ago, I conducted a study. It's a 10-year experience. It's a retrospective cohort uh, uh, of uh, factors affecting the improvement of quality of dying of terminally ill patients with cancer. So uh, we analyzed about uh, 3,000 patients, and we find out that if uh, if patient with um, lower good death score and they are um, younger and they stay longer, they have higher physician assessed autonomy and they have better physician uh, assessed emotional support and better physician reported rate of closure, they are positively uh, related with improvement in good death score. So we just, uh, so we feel that uh, probably late referral to the unit and low physician says autonomy were key factors negatively affecting quality of dying. So, so we feel that probably we need to do something to enhance the truth telling and also uh, uh, about patients' um, uh, quality of dying. Okay, so uh, I was wondering, so what are the factors affecting the patient uh, autonomy, and which is um, kind of a uh, 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 really touched topic uh, in the Chinese or in the Taiwanese culture, because we do not openly discuss the illnesses, especially with t terminally ill patients. So uh, I conducted a multi-center study, and uh, we like to know what, what, what affects the patient autonomy. And we find out that uh, the older the patient, and uh, uh, patient uh, conscious is not clear, and with poor good death score, these are important factors that will jeopardize patient's autonomy. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the Natural Death Act. So it was enacted in the year 2000, and it was basically on the patient's right to decline CPR. Uh, be before that, all the doctors has to conduct um, CPR because there's no law to protect the doctors from not doing so. So uh, this act actually protects the patient and also the doctors. The, if the patient sign uh, this uh, DNR, the doctors can uh, uh, can do accordingly. Okay. However, there's a lot of dispute or debate on withhold and withdrawal. Because this law actually guarantees the doctor uh, has, to, has the right not to do, to withdraw a lot of things such as hydration, nutrition, not to do intubation. However, it doesn't write clearly on withdrawal parts. Therefore, there are two, uh, uh, several uh, revisions and it's on the uh, withdrawal. So after the revision, all the doctors uh, um, can uh, withdraw the uh, life-sustaining treatment accordingly. But there are lots of problems with the uh, law. So we have this uh, Patient Right to Autonomy Act, and which was enacted uh, last year. The act is established to ensure respect for patient autonomy, protect the right of the patients to a good and natural death, and promote harmonious physician-patient relationship. And you can see that uh, the beautiful lady on my right, and this is actually advocates for the law, and this is Lady Yang Yuxing, and she uh, was a former legislator. You can see that she uh, suffered from certain uh, congenital uh, motor um, uh, dystrophy, muscular dystrophy. So uh, she felt that um, the original uh, pay, uh, Natural Death Act only takes care of pay, cancer patients, but the law doesn't apply to the other patients. So uh, she um, uh, and her husband, they uh, are actively 
advocates the passing of this law. So the law is indicated for five clinical conditions. It's for um, people diagnosed with a terminal uh, cancer or terminal illness, for people uh, with irreversibly uh, coma, or people in a vegetative stage, or people um, diagnosed with terminal dementia, or those diagnosed incurable. So in Taiwan, in order to, uh, to start the uh, uh, advanced uh, directive, you have to go through two processes of ACP consultations. So uh, I think these are three uh, important aspects which compare these two laws. So for the uh, Nat Natural Death Act, it's only for the terminally ill cancer patients, okay? But the new law, the Patient Right to Autonomy Act, it applies for people with five clinical conditions. So it kind of broadened the subjects who can benefit from the law. And the original law, the Natural Death Act, it usually happen when the patient are in ER or they are very, very ill. So basically, um, and a lot of people are consciously not clear. So basically it's all the surrogate who decides for the patients, okay? But the Patient Right to Autonomy Act, we encourage them to sign when they are healthy, when the patients are consciously clear. They, are, they have, in another word, they have uh, mental capacity, okay? And the third very important aspect is that in the old law, the original law, the surrogate could override the patient's will. So, you know, so it's really a pity that most of the time the patient says, I do not want any resuscitation or life sustained treatment. However, when the patient becomes comatous or consciousness is unclear, their surrogate uh, sometimes will override their wills. Okay. But in the new law, the surrogate couldn't override anything that the patient has documented. The surrogate could only monitor uh, whether uh, the patient's will has been uh, implemented. So these are three very important differences comparing the two laws. Okay, so what is ACP, advanced care planning? Uh, I think this is from uh, the Lancet Oncology. This is a very good definition. It says that ACP enables individuals who have decisional capacity to identify their values, to reflect upon the meanings and consequences of serious illness scenarios, to define goals and preferences for future medical treatment care, and to discuss these with family and healthcare providers. And ACP addresses individuals' concern across the physical, psychological, social, and spiritual domains. It encourages individuals to identify a personal representative and to record and regularly review any preferences so that their preferences can be taken into account should they, at some point, be able to make their own decisions. I think this is really perfect def definition. However, we think that this definition is probably only for Westerners. And in Asia, uh, there's a consensus that uh, there's a slight difference in terms of uh, ACP definition. Okay, and this is a little uh, literature review from Taiwan. So what are the likelihood of completing events directive in Taiwan? These are some uh, published papers and from the pa uh, patient perspective, we feel that uh, age, cognitive stage, and previous discussion of uh, DNR with family members or physicians, and the nursing home policy, these were factors related with the completion of events directive. Okay? From the family care's perspective, uh, if the fact and taking a less negative perception toward the natural death act is more willing to help patients to complete AD. From the physician's perspective, if uh, they're working in hospice and their attitude toward the uh, natural death act and knowledge about natural death act were uh, independent factors that positively influenced the participation in ACP. And uh, recently, a randomized controlled study 
concluded that uh, ACP improved psychological distress, but not quality of life or preferred end of life care of the patient. However, this study was conducted before the initiation of the um, Patient Right to Autonomy Act. So uh, it, it uh, is, is something that's before the act. So uh, probably a new study need to be conducted, okay? And a large scale ACP communication program in Taipei showed that there's an increased AD completion rate to the eligible population as a result of the program and utilization of life settings treatment decreased following AD completion. And this was conducted in uh, Taipei City Hospital. Okay. Now, uh, I think I'd like to um, discuss how we actually uh, start the uh, uh, ACP. In Taiwan, before uh, signing the advanced directive, you have to go to ACP clinics. Okay, so now at this point, I believe there are more than 100 ACP clinics all over Taiwan, from Taipei to Kaohsiung, from Hualien um, to uh, uh, Tainan. You, uh, it's almost in every hospital, so you can find an ACP clinic. Okay. And it's not under the uh, health insurance, so you have to pay for it. Uh, okay, so uh, before, before you come to the clinic, you make your appointment. There is something you have to prepare. First of all, you have to be more than 20 years uh, with the mental capacity, okay? You can make decision for yourself. And you need to uh, make appointment uh, from the hospital which is near you, okay? And you, you can invite uh, members to go with you, okay? Okay. On the day of uh, conducting ACP, um, you can go there with your second degree relative, okay? At least one person ha has to accompany you to the meeting. And you can appoint or you don't have to appoint a surrogate. It's really up to you. And what about the medical team? The ACP medical team has to comprise with a medical doctor and a nurse and a psychologist or a social worker. So at least three members of the medical team are present and they have to get trainings, uh, uh, very comprehensive trainings in ACP. But what about the content of uh, ACP consultation? Basically, we talk about uh, two um, topics. One is on uh, life-sustaining treatment, okay? Whether the patient would uh, uh, choose to uh, receive CPR, intub intubations, uh, even to discuss to uh, the issue of blood transfusion, uh, antibiotic administration, or hemodialysis. So basically, it is uh, is a big uh, uh, topic of life-sustaining treatment, and the another very culturally important topic, especially for the Asians, is the nutritional issue. Because you know, in uh, Taiwan, and I also believe in lots of uh, other parts of Asia, people concerned about the nutritional issue uh, when they're very terminally ill. Because we know that uh, in Taiwan, we, as medical doctors, we're often uh, requested by the family to give the patient artificial hydration or nutrition uh, because they think that uh, uh, they will be, uh, they will die uh, uh, with the, the family cannot tolerate to see that the patient cannot eat anything at the end. So these are two very important topics we have to discuss during the uh, ACP consultation, okay? Then the medical team will discuss the five clinical conditions one by one with uh, the patient and also with the uh, second degree uh, relative and make sure their choices, their wishes. After that, the patient sign the uh, advanced directive, okay? And it will be put into uh, the uh, IC card, the health insurance card. 
So whenever the patient goes to any hospital in Taiwan, the card will show that the patient has signed the advanced directive. So whenever the patient develops into one of the five clinical conditions in the future, the hospitals or the doctors will know immediately how to react. Okay, so this is the situation in Taiwan. Apology for this being in Chinese. Uh, I just want to show you uh, what it looks like with the five clinical conditions. So the first one says that uh, terminally ill, and uh, there are two topics to be concerned. One is about the life-sustaining treatment, and uh, the second one is about the artificial hydration nutrition. And there are uh, four choices each on a uh, spectrum of I don't want to receive anything to I want to receive uh, a life sustained treatment for a period of time, but, uh, um, but my surrogate or myself could stop, okay? And the, th the third choice is that uh, if I'm unconscious, please ask my surrogate to decide uh, until uh, please keep everything, okay? So it's a, a gradient. Uh, from not from uh, I don't want anything to I want everything. Okay, so the choices are the same for the five clinical conditions. Okay, so uh, this is like vegetative state, um, terminal dementia, or uh, at least eleven diseases that are uh, supposed to be uh, or diagnosed incurable. And this is how the advanced directive looks like. It says that uh, I have uh, received the uh, ACP consultation. I understand clearly uh, what it is, and uh, uh, I have uh, uh, made my choices. And please uh, respect my choices. And what's interesting is the last sentence. It says that uh, please, I want my relatives to respect my choices. Yeah, this is really the essence of patient right to autonomy act in Taiwan, because at this point, a lot of choices are made by the relatives uh, of the patients. Okay, so this is the actual, uh, con uh, the actual uh, scenario of conducting ACP. Uh, I'm the medical doctor, and this is nurse, and this is. Um, also a nurse, and this is our uh, so head of social worker. And this is really a couple. They are coming here for ACP. This is uh, their friend work as a, a surrogate, okay? So they come here. They're healthy people with no um, uh, severe uh, medical conditions, but they just wanna come for ACP consultation. So it's a, um, as I said, it's, a, uh, it's not a free, uh, clinic, and uh, it charges more than a hundred US dollar for the first person, and there's a reduction. <laughs> there's a reduction, and I, if, if you and we welcome more people to discuss at one time. So from my experience, I've consulted seven people at the same time. Um, so is it is it gonna um so is it popular or isn't? Well, I have to say at first, um, I kind of worry about the um, uh, <laughs> um, whether it, it will make money or not, but actually uh, it's very, very popular in Taiwan. If you want to make uh, ACP um, reservation, you have to wait until next year, okay? It's very, very popular. At this point at uh, National Town University, we've consulted 353 patients as of uh, August, okay? And um, uh, it's interesting to see there are more females. Females would like to you know, come to the ACP clinic. And the majority of them are within the 60s, okay? And interesting to see a majority of them are healthy people. So what about um, people with cancer? What about those dying patients? They're not coming for ACP. So it seems that uh, it's really um, a new frontiers to study. So we, we need to know 
what are the uh, um, timing of discussing ACP, especially in this uh, Asian, in this uh, Chinese Taiwanese uh, culture? So we um, we are very lucky. We are very uh, fortunate to uh, conduct a uh, cross cultural study with uh, Kyoto University School of Public Health, and we've studied the study. Uh, in this study, we uh, uh, we actually we've finish the study, and we uh, publish the study. And this is doc, uh, Dr. Jun, and he uh, is responsible for, uh, he is a Japanese PI, okay? Now this is Ayako, uh, an expert in uh, uh, a qualitative study, and this is a Taiwanese team, okay. Okay, so um, in our culture, uh, you, you know that in our culture, the Asian culture, we don't openly discuss uh, the illnesses, uh, especially uh, very touchy uh, topics such as advanced care planning. So we like to know and to compare when is the appropriate timing of discussing ACP uh, from the patient's perspectives, okay? So um, in the hope that if we know the right timing, we can discuss without any burden. For example, if we discuss this topic too early, some patient will feel that, uh, uh, you know, lose hope or something. But if we discuss this too late, it's not gonna be beneficial for the patients. So I think this is a very important topic within the Asian context. Okay, so uh, we like to evaluate the patients and the healthcare professionals the willingness to initiate ACP discussions at different stages of physical decline in their illnesses, both in Japan and Taiwan. And uh, we like to identify patient dependent factors related to the earliest uh, time for initiating ACP. We conduct the, a uh, multi-center cross-sectional study with questionnaires using clinical scenarios um, uh, we actually design three clinical scenarios and one with uh, uh, um, heart failure, one with stroke, the other one with uh, lung cancer. Three, uh, it, it's really on a random basis. So the patient can answer questions uh, uh, and decide when is appropriate timing of answer of uh, starting ACP. So it's a scenario based questionnaire. Okay. So um, uh, we recruited uh, community dwelling adults aged from 40 to 75. They are competent to answer the questionnaires. And we uh, exclude those who uh, can't answer the questionnaire due to dementia or any CNS disorders, okay? So in Japan, we recruited uh, patients from four uh, outpatient clinics, okay? In Taiwan, we recruit a patient from two outpatients from the Department of Family Medicine in National Taiwan University and the Taipei City Hospital. Okay, and about the healthcare providers, we also recruited uh, the medical doctors, nurses, and social workers involved in caring geriatric patients uh, with at least three years of experiences more of professional experiences and uh, uh, the same um, uh, inclusion exclusion criteria, both in Taiwan and Japan. So what about the outcome? The outcome measurement is really uh, the frailty, okay? So we measure uh, uh, if the patient is uh, normal, pre-frail, too frail, okay? So the definition for normal is that without any health problem, the definition for pre-frail is that uh, be able to walk without cane uh, or a gut tire much more easily, but they still can conduct lots of daily activities. When they uh, define frailty, which means that the physical function was declined and lost the weight of more than 10 kilos, okay? So uh, for example, like a lung can cancer patients, uh, the scenario begins from the patient is healthy and gradually, the patient um, is getting treatment uh, like chemotherapy or um, uh, uh, radiotherapy. And, and we, 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 you know, at each stage, we ask 
the patient, do you think this is the right timing to complete, uh, to start talking ACP? So it's like, um, we, we like to know when the patient feel it's the right timing to discuss this issue. Okay, and this is a result from Taiwan. Uh, we have four figures here. Figure one is the timing to start ACP discussion for scenario one, people with cerebral infarction, okay, it's non-cancer. And figure two is people with heart failure. And people three is um, uh, people with lung cancer. And figure four is a total of non-cancer scenarios. Okay, and what the, what the color stands for? Um, blue color stands for when, pa when the patient is non-frail. Uh, Orange one stands for early prefrail, the gray one stands late prefrail, or the yellow one stays frail. So you can see from here, and the first bar represents the medical doctor's response, and this is the nurse response, and social worker response, and this represents the patients, okay? So if you take a look from the scenario one, those who uh, answer um, uh, uh, scenario one, you can find out that irrespective of doctors, uh, of medical professionals, or patients. They want to discuss ACP early when they are not frail, when they are healthy. You know, most of people, including medical professional and the, the patient, want to discuss early, okay? Okay, and you can see that uh, the patient would like to discuss early than the medical doctors or the nurses, okay? And what about the second scenario, the heart failure? Same here. The patient want to discuss ACP early than the medical doctors, okay? And what about patient with lung cancer? Okay, here. Oh, yeah, more doctors would like to discuss early with patients, okay? So about the now we find out that there's a phenomenon, which is that uh, with uh, non-cancer patients, actually they want to discuss ACP earlier than the doctors, than the nurses, okay? And this, you know, this bar, the social workers, almost 90%, uh, more than 90% would like to discuss ACP early. And why is that? Because the social workers in Taiwan are responsible for uh, the promotion or the advocacy of ACP. So they know it well, they know it should be conducted when the patients are uh, healthy. Okay, so from the patient side, what are the factors facilitate to select the non-frail stage for initiating ACP? So uh, after a logistic regression, we find out that age, social support, and preferences of end-of-life cares are three most important factors in Taiwan. We find out the older the patient, they would like to discuss ACP. And that is contrary to the phenomenon in Japan. We find out in Japan, the older the patient, they hesitate to discuss ACP. And we attribute this phenomenon to probably in Taiwan, we have this uh, Natural Death Act law about 20 years ago. So uh, probably uh, there's more, uh, you know, people get more educated and they um, are more and more accepting uh, uh, the philosophy of death, okay? And what about social support? The better the social support, the, the more willing to discuss ACP early, okay? And also the attitude. If they're taking a more supportive attitude to the Natural Death Act, they would like to talk or discuss ACP early. So this is the situation in Taiwan, okay? If we compare the two countries together, Okay, this is uh, Japan and Taiwan. You can see that, yes, everybody want to discuss ACP early, okay? In, um, with three scenarios, you know, everybody want to discuss early, um, but in Taiwan, more people would like to discuss earlier than in Japan, okay? So it's probably because uh, Taiwan has the laws and uh, we, um, uh, I think the law really helped a lot. Okay, so we're very uh, grateful that uh, it has been published this year, and uh, um, and 
you can take a reference if you're interested. Okay. And last year is really an ACP year because uh, we held a uh, Taipei Declaration of ACP. We invited uh, six uh, uh, experts from uh, six Asian countries um, to uh, discuss and we uh, uh, made a declaration on the definition and roles of uh, ACP. Okay, we invited uh, 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 profession, uh, professional experts from Japan. You can see Dr. Masa, and also you can see uh, Dr. Helen from um, Hong Kong. And we invited uh, uh, Dia from Indonesia, and we invited, uh, um, okay, and uh, sorry, I can't see it clearly, uh, uh, Lisa from Korea. Okay, all six countries experts to uh, discuss. Okay, and um, we um, uh, ran into a, an editorial and published in Journal Private Medicine immediately. Okay, so in this um, type of declaration, we um, refine the definition a little bit. We add a sentence. We feel that the advanced care planning is a tailored and culturally adapted development and implementation in a compassionate Asian society, emphasizing the importance of family involvement in the individual's decision-making in terms of future medical care. An influence of the cultural factors of filial piety should also be highlighted. Nevertheless, advanced care planning should be prospective and shouldn't be jeopardized despite cultural differences. Okay, so um, actually it uh, defines uh, ACP on the roles and tasks of medical professionals. We think that the uh, quality of care and patients informed decision making, cl clinicians should conduct discussions with the patients their family members if appropriate, on the patient's medical conditions and future care based on patient's readiness, okay? And as patient's preferences can change over time, clinicians should assist the patient to share his or her preferences regarding care and conduct ACP discussions with regularly as needed. And the clinicians should document the contents of such discussion every time. The team should provide uh, care consistently with the patient's preferences, such as facilitating a patient's wishes to die at home if applicable and possible. The medical care team must actively remind patients, especially those with terminal illness, to consider advanced directives to the process of ACP and choices of life sustaining medical treatment. Okay? The social worker should help arrange places for care services based on the patient's preferences, and assist the patient family to register and complete AD through the available resources, such as ACP clinics, okay? So we conclude that the uh, advanced directive through the process of ACP ensures patient autonomy. And patients are willing to discuss ACP earlier than medical doctors. The majority of patients were willing to begin discussions before their health was severely compromised. Patients are willing to begin until clearly facing their end of life for a minority. And to promote ACP, primary care physicians should be mindful of patients' preferences and factors associated with acceptance and reluctance to initiate ACP. Okay, so uh, um, that's our uh, um, cross cultural study with Kyoto University. And uh, we also made this type of declaration with six Asian countries, okay? And now I'd like to introduce another interesting study, which, because we, uh, we've, uh, com we compare uh, the attitude of uh, ACP with healthy um, patients, and now we like to do a comparison of preferences on the timing of initiating ACP and withdrawing life sustaining treatment between terminally ill cancer patients and their main family caregivers. We think it's quite important. We, we like to know uh, if they are, are concordant or not concordant. So, so this is a prospective study, a, a small study 
conducted a, uh, in the PCU of National Taiwan University. In this study, we just want to know their uh, concordance that they're on the timing of ACP and also their attitude on the life-sustaining treatment. And we enroll patients from the PCU and also from the outpatients. To our surprise, we find out that uh, there's a high concordance. It's just like uh, the patients and families think we should talk ACP when uh, we are healthy, we're non-frail. And this is really to our surprise because in our culture, it's, it's usually the family give us a hard time. They don't want to discuss ACP. They don't want to discuss the AD. But this study really surprised us. We find out actually through all these years of education, now they're thinking in the same direction. Okay, what about the attitude toward life-sustaining treatment? And this is interesting. We find out that uh, they don't want both of the patients and family. They don't want CPR. They don't want intubation. And uh, however, both of them still want artificial hydration nutrition. And actually, we're not surprised about this because many Taiwanese um, think this is a, actually this is a food, okay? And they, they actually think this is some kind of lifeline. If they stop, their life will stop as well, okay? And they don't want to stop antibiotics, okay? And they don't want to stop blood transfusions. And we ask a very uh, uh, critical question. Do you feel uncomfortable when you discuss ACP with medical personnel at early stage? And both the patients and the family members answer, no, they feel not at all. And uh, do you think uh, the discussion of ACP is meaningful? And a high proportion of both patients and families say, yes, we think it's a very meaningful thing. Therefore, from this study, we learned that uh, Please don't hesitate to discuss patient uh, this topic, uh, even in the uh, in the Chinese or uh, Taiwanese context. Okay, so uh, we conclude that the patient's preferences on the timing of initiating ACP and Western life sustaining treatment were found to be similar and consistent with their family caregivers. Majority of participants considered to have. Uh, ACP earlier when patients were at non-frail stage. Meanwhile, patients' frail stage prognosis was identified as timing for life sustaining treatment to withdrawal, except for nutrition and hydration, antibiotics or blood transfusion. And Taiwanese people's medical decision-making processes might be shaped differently by the cultural characteristics such as relational stance of autonomy and social norm filial piety. These should be further explored by qualitative research to understand the meaning behind the decision-making processes and take into account while initiating discussions regarding life-sustaining treatments and ACP with patients and the family caregivers in the future. Okay, uh, we are also very grateful that uh, um, we published this paper. Uh, okay. And this year, with the pandemic, uh, because we cannot go abroad, we cannot travel abroad. So the only thing we can do is to stay in office and write papers, okay? So I'm very grateful that with six countries, uh, uh, after invitation by Dr. Tasia Morita, we've published this review article of uh, advanced care planning Asian culture uh, on JJCO, okay? So in this paper, there's a very detailed discussion of ACP in six Asian countries from um, policy, uh, academic, and clinical perspectives. And there are very nice comparisons uh, among each countries. Therefore, I'd like to conclude that uh, ACP in Taiwan, from the policy perspective, now we have this um, uh, new law, the Patient Right to Autonomy Act, which actually goes one step further to protect the right of the patient. So uh, not only the terminally cancer patient can benefit from the law and extend to five clinical conditions 
So um, we, uh, we also encourage patients to uh, write the, uh, to sign this law when they're healthy and they're young, okay? And clinically, uh, there are lots of ACP clinics uh, growing rapidly uh, all over Taiwan. The number are increasing and uh, in the hope that uh, we'll provide more access for the patients. And academically, we've conducted some study um, uh, to understand the uh, appropriate timing of initiating ACP. We find out that actually uh, in Taiwan or in Japan, both people uh, want to uh, start ACP as early as possible, okay? And uh, from research, we also find out there's a relational autonomy, which is distinct from the present ACP discussion. We find that the, uh, in Asian culture, uh, the family exerts a uh, quite an influence uh, to the patient. So what about the future goals? Uh, because at this point, uh, you might find out that um, for those people who have signed ACP, a majority, up to 90% of them, are healthy people. What about those who are suffering? What about those uh, who are facing death? So we should uh, create some kind of mechanism to help them, to facilitate them to assign, uh, assign the uh, advanced directive. So um, uh, we're now conducting a uh, randomized uh, study to a trial to see if uh, any um, any uh, uh, educational module will help um, to these uh, terminally ill patients to evaluate the um, ACP completion rate, rate among the cancer patients. And we like to uh, conduct a survey to know what are the barriers for completing uh, ACP. So this is a three-year program sponsored by the Taiwanese uh, scientific um, uh, uh, educational bureau. So uh, uh, I think uh, after uh, next time, probably I can share with you the uh, results. And we are very uh, grateful that uh, there's a, uh, a Asian ACP Delphi sponsored by APHN. And, and I think the PI uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Okay, is um, Japan, and uh, we've been doing this. Now we are doing the uh, second round, the expert opinion, okay? And I know there are lots of study going on and discussing the ACP under the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, uh, Taiwan didn't take part because we only have seven cases at this point. Okay, so um, I like to do a SWOT analysis to analyze uh, uh, the effectiveness of ACP. Actually, I feel that uh, the strength is that by doing ACP, it ensures patient right to a good death, and it's not limited to the terminally ill, and it, you know, by assigning the uh, uh, AD, it will cause less medical expenditure. However, there are lots of weaknesses. We have to have a very strong infrastructure, and too many doc for many doctors, the ACP clinics really had their loadings because we're already very, very uh, busy in the hospital. Now we have to take the ACP clinic. It's, so, uh, it's loading to a lot of doctors. And you might know that uh, the medical reimbursement to doctors is very low in Taiwan. So this is another problem. And also, there's low public awarenesses. Um, uh, there's a geographic diversity. For example, in Taipei or Kaohsiung, a metropolitan city, people know ACP well. However, if you go to a more suburban uh, places, like um, you know, suburban places, probably they never heard of what ACP is. So this is um, something we have to overcome. And what about opportunity? Yes, actually, the ACP emphasizes on pet care. Um, it gives um, uh, a medical professional more choices. You know, it, it also the patients, the doctors more more choices and guarantees their rights. And in some way, it attracts more medical professionals who want to go to palliative care. They feel that uh, now they have more roles. 
they have more, um, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's like it really attract them to get into this field. I think manpower is right because in order uh, to conduct ACP, uh, not only the the, the doctors uh, feel very uh, lots of loading. Also, the nurses, the social workers, yeah, they need training. They need um, uh, more working uh, time. So it's, it's, it is it is a threat. However, we know that uh, last year the World Hospitals and Health Care Day, the slogan is "My Care and My Right," and this year the Taiwan Academy of Hospitals Pet Medicine, the general. Assembly, and our slogan is also my care, my right, in the Taiwanese way. So ACP has become a very important topic and issue, and uh, there are more to be explored. Okay, thank you very much. I welcome all kinds of questions. <laughs>